previously we began this discussion of saturated versus unsaturated acids, uh, fatty acids at least, and the whole discussion with omega-3 and omega-6s and incorporating them into our diet. Um, we ended the previous video by saying that a fat is a fat is a fat. Uh, studies have shown that if you can take butter out of the pitcher and replace that with an oil like olive oil instead, then it's healthier for you. And that's true. You know, do I want to be cooking with a slab of butter or do I want to be cooking with olive oil instead? If I had to have the choice, I would prefer olive oil. But you need to remember that a uh, fat is a fat. So olive oil is still a fat and you're still cooking with a fatty acid just like you were butter. So a lot of people and some of the studies are now showing that, well, if you stay with a saturated fat, as long as you don't overkill it, Paula Dane, then you can kind of get by with it and it's okay because a little slab of butter maybe isn't as problematic as what we once thought. And what begins to happen is that people use olive oil and they think they can use olive oil for everything and they douse it in the pan and fry whatever they want to fry up. They douse it on their potatoes and they eat it raw and they dip their bread in it and they think that it's okay because we've told them and they've seen these articles that unsaturated fats are healthy for you. Well, no, it's still a fat. So don't overkill it and don't abuse it. And that's what people are doing. They are ab still abusing the whole use of a fat in the kitchen. So if you do use olive oil, it probably is better than some butter, but you can't overkill it. You've got to use very small, limited amounts of it. Still, don't be slathering everything that you want to in it. So you're going to see that this article says replacing saturated fats with unsaturated fats is one of the healthiest changes, says this PhD and says this nutritionist uh, from the um, uh, an American association of blah, 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 right? So saute in canola or vegetable oil instead of butter. Put olive oil or another flavor oil over vegetables to spice them up. Dip your bread in olive oil instead of putting butter on it. Use non-hydrogenated margarine in place of butter. Make cream sauces with yogurt and flavoring oil-based salad dressings over creamy salad dressings. Those are what they recommend for you to change in your diet to get away from the saturated fats when you can. However, notice in all of these cases you are still eating a fat. No matter how you look at it, you're still eating lipids and in this case fatty acids and you can't ever get away from that idea. So some people will say, well, I put a little bit of butter on my bread, but you know, I'm using olive oil. So I'm going to douse the whole bowl full of olive oil and I'm going to sit there and I'm going to soak up all that olive oil and I'm going to eat every bit of it. And it's going to be okay because they told me olive oil was healthy for me. I put rub olive oil on my face to help my co co complexion. I put olive oil in my hair to make my hair shine and glisten and glow. Well, that's the misnomer that people have. You can't do that. You can't do it. And who wants to put olive oil on their skin? I don't want to be oily like that. That's nasty. So number two, add nuts to your menu. Uh, nuts, omega-3s, and omega-6s. So these are very good. A lot of people just simply don't eat enough nut in their diet. So uh, start incorporating those into your foods. You know, take a look at your walnuts. Take a look at your cashews. Uh, very often it's very easy to throw those into a chicken stir fry. Or it's very easy to put those into a curry if you're making one at home. Uh, it's very easy to add those to your salads and spruce up the salad a little bit. Uh, instead of tomato sauce, use pesto sauce instead. Um, and uh, that typically is made sometimes with walnut that you can finally grind up and mix in with your basil and your garlic and your olive oil. Uh, so uh, start taking a look at nuts. Start incorporating and expanding your part of the diet when it concerns that if you're worried about your omega-3s and your omega-6s. 
And then finally down here at the bottom is fish, of course. Again, they're stating it one more time. Please eat some fish is what they're basically saying. So even vegetarians, you know, we know that you don't like to eat anything with eyeballs that breathe and move. But, you know, pork and beef and chicken, a lot of vegetarians will completely stay away from. However, you do find some vegetarians that break the rules a little bit and bring in a little bit of fish into the diet. You even see that with vegetarian restaurants as well. You will see strictly vegetarian food items and then you'll see them dabble into a little bit of fish as well for those people that do like to eat sushi, for those people that like to eat a nice piece of salmon every now and then. It's out there for them. And you do see some vegetarians that will have that spin on the diet uh, just because of the health benefits that come uh, from that nice lean piece of protein. So take a look at, this is coming straight from WebMD, take a look at some of these resources that you're going to see with omega fatty acids. Again, we cannot synthesize the omega fatty acids. We have to obtain them from the diet. And if you're a vegetarian and you cut out your fish and you cut out all of your meat product, and you limit the amount of oils that you use in your cooking, because let's face it, a lot of the oils and a lot of the cooking um, from olive oil and vegetable oil comes from sauteing those meats, comes from sauteing or frying up those pork chops and those chicken breast and those big pot roast. And a lot of vegetarians, because they remove meat from their diet, no longer really have a need for a lot of that oil-based cooking. And if you're not ingesting oils, if you're not ingesting fish, then at least eat a handful of nuts every now and then to make yourself feel better and to prevent you from going crazy because of your diet. Okay, so that's going to sum up basically this term of omega fatty acids. Uh, and that's going to be your kind of nutrition uh, lesson uh, for this portion of the lecture as far as fatty acids go. Uh, something else that we can look at are things called waxes uh, that delve into the whole role of fatty acids as well. So if I want to go and take a look at this definition of a wax, I can do that. And a wax are basically esters. They're not carboxylic acids. They are going to be esters. And these esters have very long carbon chains. So they're similar to a fatty acid, but they're a little bit different because fatty acids do not have any ester functional groups. Ester functional groups, if you remember, are C double bond O with an O group. And there's an R group and an R group on each side. So that basically means that this ester has an alkyl group to the left and an alkyl group to the right. So with a wax, these are typically long hydrocarbon chains, and then we get to a carbon that has a double bond O and an oxygen on it, and then it continues on a chain again. So this is the template for a wax, and you know what a wax is. You go to the grocery store, you go down the candy aisle, and you take a look at paraffin wax. Some people use paraffin wax as a candy mold. They use it to harden their chocolates and harden their candies up and you just melt it down it turns into a liquid notice what I said you melt it down most of these paraffin waxes well there's not double bonds associated with the hydrocarbon tails so the van der Waals forces are very strong and you're going to see very high melting points and boiling points to these waxes and most of them are solids at room temperature for that reason they also have very very long carbon chains. Don't be surprised if you see 40 carbons lined up back to back to back with the structures of these waxes. So take a look at paraffin wax. You can buy that in a store. Um, it's very oily and greasy kind of filling. You can chop it up, break it up, melt it down, and incorporate that into your candy making. Uh, here is a picture of paraffin wax that has been basically broken down into small little beads. Um, the paraffin wax that typically is used in product uh, it ranges anywhere from 20 to 40 carbons, as this article states. And um, 
uh, they're giving you an example of a paraffin wax down here at the very bottom. So this is just uh, a paraffin wax, uh, not necessarily the paraffin wax that they sell here. It could be a mixture of different ones, uh, but they're giving you some possible uh, applications other than candy making, really, that you can do with paraffin wax. And this includes lubrication, electrical insulation, and the making of candles. So uh, if you do have this candle making company at home and uh, you want not to use beeswax because that's an all natural candle that they can sell for 20 and $30. But if you want to use um, uh, basically a paraffin wax, a cheaper version of a candle that burns maybe a little bit dirtier or a little bit differently, uh, then paraffin wax is typically the go-to wax to make those products. So yeah, next time you burn that candle, remember that wax could be in somebody's homemade Reese cup that they want to eat and that they are putting into their mouth and eating it. Yum, yum, yum. Welcome to the world of lipids all over again. My hips love lipids. My buttocks love lipids. And my belly loves lipids. Not to mention my tongue because they all taste good too. If it doesn't, if it tastes good, that means it's bad for you. That's something that you learn uh, very early on when you begin to learn how to cook. Right? So that's the story with paraffin wax, and that's also the story with the term wax in general. So uh, there's many different types of wax. Beeswax is one, uh, canuba wax, um, all different types of, of waxes are out there that have many different purposes, and that's the common structure for those waxes. They are long carbons that have ester functional groups in them, not carboxylic acid groups. And that is how they're different than the whole fatty acid family uh, of the uh, lipids. So uh, the next video, we're going to take a look at fats and oils in a little bit more detail. And we're going to go through and talk about um, different types of fats and what makes an oil and how maybe I can take a solid fat and convert it over to a liquid aka oil for me and what that means as far as product placement goes on your grocery store shelves. So keep in touch. Don't run off and leave me. I know I've probably scared you a little bit on your cooking and kitchen habits, but trust me, it gets worse. The more you know, the more scared that you become.